just fucking send a text out and um, fuck with some of the guys and girls that, uh, that, that you served with if, if, if you were in um, different occupations or whatnot. Um, just reach out to people. Um, it's really just a text. It doesn't take, take that much. And we're rolling. What's up, John? Not much, man. Thank you for, uh, for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here, brother. Uh, just start off by just introducing yourself. Uh, you know, um, tell us what branch of service you served with, which years, uh, and the job you did. My name's John Shower. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps from 2006 to 2010. Um, initially, I worked with the Scout Snipers briefly, moved over to the infantry, and that's where I spent the majority of my time. Nice. Um, what rank did you get out as? Uh, E4 the day I got out. Wow. Right on. Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, your upbringing. Where are you from and what was your childhood upbringing like? I'm from all over the world. Um, all, all the men in my family are military, so I grew up in Alaska originally, Europe through the middle part of my life, and back to the U.S., um, uh, I ended up being, I think, out here for about the last 14 years-ish here in Orange County. Uh, so I, I call it home now. Mm, awesome. Um, what inspired you to join the military? Um, I think it was a, a, a big part was 9-11 was just a couple years before I had joined. Uh, so that was something that kind of was ringing the, ringing the bells for a lot of people my age. Uh, going to graduate high school in 2005. Uh, that mixed with all the men in my family being military. My dad was a fighter pilot. Uh, uncle was a SEAL, grandfather of Vietnam, so on and so forth. Uh, they had a huge impact on my life. Um, growing up, they were kind of the big, big mentors and supporters. So I, I'd say it was kind of a, a merge between those two that, that kind of pushed me in that direction. Mm. How old were you when you enlisted? Um, 19. I spent one year... Uh, being a dummy, maxing out credit cards, running all over the place, and uh, being a, a stupid 18-year-old before I decided to figure things out. Uh, and what job did you get? You went in, in infantry? Uh, pr primarily, yes. I, I initially in docked with, with the sniper teams and was work, doing a workup with them. Um, decided to actually, voluntary, I decided to go um, back over to the infantry where I knew a lot of the guys uh, because it was a two-year wait to, to get into sniper school. I figured if I'm doing a four-year enlistment, I didn't want to waste my time uh, kind of sitting there to where I, I go through the school and maybe get one deployment uh, in that field where all the guys were like, oh, you come, come kick down doors over here in the infantry. So uh, I ended up moving over there after about four months uh, and spending the remaining time uh, in the infantry. Um, did you anticipate that you might end up in a, in a war zone, go overseas? Uh, yeah, 2006, yeah. Um, I... I figured I would. I think I wanted it. Um, I was a, a hard head. I mean, most of us were. I mean, especially if you were in, in any kind of combat position or role. I was hard headed. I wanted it. I wanted to be in that. I, wa I wanted it to be hard and difficult um, to kind of prove myself. So, yeah, I, I, I figured um, infantry units were going back to back basically with six month um, uh, buildups and deployments at that time. So, I, I figured I would be going over there. Mm. And uh, what, what was your. Uh what, what was your first unit assignment? 1-7. Uh, so I, I was with 1-7 uh, Baker Company. So uh, we primarily operated in the Western Anbar province uh, through the few deployments that I had during that time. Um, anywhere ranging from going through Ramadi initially into Hit, uh, Cubesa, uh, a couple other small towns right in there. Uh, the last deployment was in Karma. Mm. So when you get dropped to your unit, how long, how long before you ended up overseas? I believe it was six months, really short for me, because uh, like I said, I, I had indocked and passed with the, the sniper group, uh, worked up with them for a little bit, then decided a lot of my buddies were saying, hey, come over here, come over here, um, rolled over there and had about two months, two and a half months of a buildup before we went on our first deployment. Mm, so you got kind of dropped into like a workup? Yes, I mean, immediately into a workup. It was quick. Mm. And, uh, you know, talk to me about what that first deployment was like for you. Where did you go? Um, what did you experience? Um, well, we, uh, we, we basically took over an abandoned train station uh, from a previous unit in Hit, uh, where we spent most of our time. We had went through Ramadi on our way to Hit uh, and primarily operated in Hit and Kibesa at the time. Uh, that, that's where I spent that first seven months. It was 
similar weather to 29 Palms, where, where one seven is actually located out of. Uh, so, so the heat was relatively similar. Um, I, I mean, I, it's hard to fully explain. Um, I remember being in a helicopter right when we were actually initially going into that area. Um, and my hands were, uh, holding on to the, the straps that were over my chest. This is kind of one funny thing I'll never forget. And I was squeezing really tight and I didn't realize how tight I was squeezing the straps. And um, my team leader looked at me and he just put his finger up and started flicking me off like this. And uh, probably because I looked scared. And by the time we had landed, I remember I like couldn't open my hands. And when I looked down, they were like almost blue because I was squeezing so tight. And I'll never forget that experience. Like, man, my fucking ass is really over here right now. Um, so that was kind of one of the funny, funny first instances I had. Yeah. Wow. Um, when you got off that helo, um, did you did you fly into a base? I would imagine there's already like bases uh, established and stuff out there. Yeah, after Kuwait, we flew into uh, I believe we flew into Al Assad hmm. initially, and then from Al Assad made our way uh, made our way towards Hit. Mm, okay. Um, do you remember what your guys' primary mission was out there for you guys initially? Um, we, we were relieving, I believe, a small group, uh, in the army at that time. And it was basically, um, like they said, trying to, trying to basically maintain friendship with the local populace while, uh, carrying out some of the, some of the missions at that time with, um, some of the chic, uh, chic individuals and, and, um, uh, some of the caches, weapons caches, things of that nature, basically running daily operations, uh, to keep a presence in that area, uh, take care of any issues that were going on. I mean, like most guys uh, from the infantry during that time period, it was basically the job was three different things. We were either going to be on a QRF, you know, a quick reaction force, uh, where you're kind of there just in case something happens to guys out on the missions. Uh, you have a small group that's doing daily missions, uh, day or night. Now intel comes in, uh, bad things are going on, and they run a mission through the night. Uh, you have things like that, or just daily patrols, um, making sure things are going okay uh, in that neighboring area that you're in at the time, uh, and then some sort of post watch. And we kind of rotated uh, with those three positions um, through the time we were over there. Basically, you're just kind of sitting on that post, keep keeping watch of that area that uh, that you have for you know x amount of time, and you kind of do maybe three day, four day shifts where you're kind of rotating through those three things. Mm. So I'm curious, was there ever a moment or re recall a moment where like, fuck, this, this is, this is real shit. Like we're fucking really in the shit here. Uh, a few instances. Yeah. Um, the, uh, some of the Iraqi army, I, it, actually the first two kind of experiences was when I was on a post, <laughs> as funny as that is. Uh, so somewhat more protected than being out on a, on a patrol or some sort of QRF, um, immediate response. Uh, one of them was, um, one of the old school, like 1970s Chevys that the Iraqi army used, or whatever these trucks were, that they just mount a gun on top of. Um, they had started uh, opening fire in one of the local parts of the city uh, that I could see from my post. Um, to me, that was kind of the first time I'd seen open fire. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, and they were chasing somebody in, in the city at that time. I'd called it in. Uh, they said it wasn't a, a problem for us to, to, to deal with. So watching kind of a gun start kind of blasting towards the side of a building where I saw uh, people, innocent people kind of walking around. That, that was an interesting uh, experience that kind of blew my, blew my eyes open and I wasn't doing anything about it at that second. Um, another one was actually, I think a day or two after that, taking sniper fire on a post where I have a very small piece of glass kind of in front of me and some wood. Um, that definitely opened my eyes a little bit as well where you, know, you, you hear that first splinter of wood uh, beside you and you think ah what what was that I don't really fucking know what that was and it happens again you're like oh fuck I think somebody's actually uh you know taking some shots from a distance at uh, at my post so those those were the two I'd say that kind of hit first um just from being on on post initially and that was before uh going out on any kind of uh, mission patrol or, or QRF reaction mm. um how long were, did you spend out there on your first tour seven months seven months um, you know, we always talk about like the, the, you know, close calls and stuff, but we'll get to that. You know, if you, uh, I, th I think earlier you said you lost a couple of guys. Um, but, um, what was your favorite part about being out there? You know, it, were there any good times? 
Did you have any downtime um, where you made the best of the situation, being that you're in the middle of a fucking war zone and people are trying to kill you? How do you cope with that while you're out there? Um, you know, I, I believe that in chaos you also find a nirvana. Uh, at least I found a nirvana, and I know a lot of the guys I was with did as well, where um, here in the U.S., I'm worried about what's my paycheck tomorrow. Can I pay my bills? I got to go to the grocery store. I got to pay this. I got to do that. Although your life is a lot more on the line in a scenario like that, you're not dealing with the daily bullshit um, that a lot of times you do here in the U.S. And there's a piece to that. There's a piece to I need to worry about my food that I'm going to eat. I'm going to worry about the guy to my left and my right. Um, I'm going to deal with situations in real time as they come. And although I'm struggling physically, or I'm having this fucking problem or that. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's almost simplistic in nature. Uh, and to me, there was a piece to that. Uh, as crazy as it sounds, and you know that, and as difficult as it is, um, whether it's a bad day, good day, this day, um, that or the other, um, there's simplicity in that. And you, I, I have found myself yearning almost kind of for that as well, uh, even at this point in my life. Um, and another big part of it was an untouched camaraderie. You know, like the ability to just read the motherfucker's mind to my left. I, I knew the joke he was going to say before he said it. And you get so deep because of the time you have with these guys that um, you're able to talk about the philosophies of life at the deepest level, um, the darkest roots of humanity. Uh, and, and that was kind of an interesting thing that I've never experienced anywhere else either was um, that level of, of deepness, friendship, camaraderie. Uh, so I, I think those two are, are definitely big takeaways that they don't never forget. Mm. Um, for me, I noticed that it gave me a, a deep level of appreciation for everything that I had back home. Uh, I remember I would I would uh, pray and uh, you know tell God, hey God, if you just get me back home, I don't give a fuck if I'm homeless in the USA for the rest of my life. I'll be a happy motherfucker. Did you experience feelings like that? Very, very much so. Yeah, I, I was telling, uh, I, it was probably my wife, I think I was telling uh, not too long ago, but I used to come home, I'll never forget, we'd, we'd, once we finally get off the buses at 29 Palms, we'd be on this field, I would just kiss the grass. I'd be like, fuck, like, yeah, like I'm, I'm here right now, I'm okay. Like, um, so yes, I mean, it, a huge amount of appreciation. Um, you have food, you have a bath. It's so so silly because some of the things that we talk about, is, it's very cliche. Um, but uh, I'll never forget briefly too, we were at OP um, just doing like a low-key observation point. Uh, it was called OP 110, I believe. Uh, so we're way up in these, uh, up in this like creviced plateau in Iraq, uh, just outside of Hit in between Kibesa and Hit. I think we were there for like 10 days. It was during Christmas and you pack in what you're gonna eat. So you pack in as little as possible. And everybody had eaten everything that they had. I had one MRE left. And um, I remember I hadn't eaten in like a day and a half. I was starving. I was getting towards the last day. And I had opened it up. It was like a peanut butter with some fucking bread. It was one of those ones. That was all I had left. And I was making it. And I sat, sat it down. And this windstorm just came and destroyed everything in like three seconds. Threw my shit on the ground. It was rolling in the dirt. The guys are laughing because they're assholes. And I grab it, and I just, it's full of dirt, and I just start eating it. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. And, and so you think of those moments, and you're like, you know, when you're starving, what are you willing to do, um, you know, when you're this hungry, when you're that? And so, yes, you know, a huge amount of appreciation for having the ability to do kind of whatever you need when you need to here. That's hilarious, man. I, I, uh, I have a similar story where I fucking dropped my, che dropped my cheese and crackers, dude, face fucking down in the sand. And you know how fucking cheese and crackers is a commodity, dude. I picked that shit up and didn't give a fuck. I fucking <laughs> ate that shit like it didn't happen. <laughs> so that's crazy, man. Um, how often do, would you guys get contact out there? You were out there for about seven months, man. Uh, how, how, um... You know, the, the, the first appointment I was on, we weren't receiving super heavy contact. We did receive you know, long distance shots on posts constantly at nighttime. That was one thing that was uh, very interesting to me. We had received contact um, here and there, little bits and pieces. 
um, some IEDs here and there. It was, it was really our, our second deployment where we had a lot more uh, contact and it was primarily IED contact. Um, uh, you know, 155 shells, pressure plates. It was a huge problem on our second deployment uh, out of Karma. Uh, I think they called it IED Alley. So even like the one seven resupply vehicles stopped resupplying us on that second appointment because they were getting hit so bad just to get to us. So we were receiving air drops. So it was really the second deployment where oddly, um, I think we had a lot more issues and where I experienced a lot more issues uh, and sadly like unseen issues um, more than more than the guy kind of jumping out with an AK. It was just um, constant fucking issues with with IEDs. Mm. Um, before we get into your second deployment, after your first deployment, when you guys got back, well, you specifically, um, did you feel any different? Uh, did that experience like change you in any way? Um, uh, yeah. Um, not that I needed to be this way because my, you know, the, the men in my family who, who are kind of like my guiding stars, um, not that they ever wanted or needed it from me, but I felt accomplished to them. Um, having been military guys, I felt like I could maybe not necessarily relate exactly, but that I was on par to be able to be a man to them. Um, and maybe that was something inside my own head. Uh, so yeah, I think that I felt different knowing that I feel like I had accomplished something great. Um, I had done something greater than myself, whether later on down the road, you thought you should have been there, you shouldn't have been there, whatever case that may be, I accomplished something very difficult and I was there with the people beside me giving everything I had. So yeah, I, I, I think I came back and I did kind of have a chip on my shoulder um, in that regard that, yeah, I, I had felt like, you know, I had done something and I could at least make people proud that, that had raised me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, especially the people in your family, because you come from a big military family. So um, you did something that you knew they were going to be proud about, right? Uh, but you just mentioned about uh, you mentioned about the war. I want to hit on. Uh, you brought up a good point, regardless of why you were there or not. Um, like personally, you know, sometimes us as veterans we get some shit because of the whoever made the decision to go to war. Can you help people explain like why it is you're there? Why you know, and just to try to give you some context, as I always try to explain, like. I didn't fucking make the decision to go to combat. Like I, I was, you know, I enlisted, I was in this unit at this fucking time and it was my job to go here because they fucking said that's where I'm going and we fight for each other. So I'm just curious on what's your um, point of view on that since you brought that up. Yeah, I, this this is probably one of the largest tough questions that um, even I'm, I reflect on now to, to think about and try and figure out. Um, you know, I could look at something like 9-11 and think to myself, I don't really, I don't know if anybody will ever know the true reality of, of what happened or what didn't happen. Um, but it doesn't matter at the end of the day because um, what I was told and, and what I believed was that we needed to support and protect the country. And I had the fucking balls to do it and I didn't give a fuck. Um, that's kind of where my head sits. And once once you go past that into the environment, um, regardless, you're there to support the person to your left and right. And, and that matters, you know, um, a lot of times a close friend of mine, he gets very emotional with the subject on, on people saying, well, you shouldn't have been, you know, we shouldn't have been there in the first place and you didn't do shit for those people. But in real time, maybe it was for a day, maybe it was for a month, but there was a lot of people getting helped over there that, couldn't fend for themselves, didn't have money for this or that, couldn't move, couldn't leave, um, that maybe did have an extension of life of six months, that maybe did get to see their family for another uh, year or two because, you know, we had some control and some capacity. So I think the way I get through it is thinking regardless of left or right, there's, there's sometimes there's wrong decisions, sometimes there's good ones, but in the moment, when I couldn't do anything about it anyways, I did the best I could for the people around me um, and for the people in that community, uh, whether it was a combative situation or whether it was uh, hugging somebody or whether it was just being there for my boy to my left or my right. And I think that's what's most important. Yeah, no, I, exactly, man. You hit the nail on the head for me when you said even if it's just hugging somebody because they're not fucking the people, you know, 
talking this shit aren't there and seeing the interactions that you're having, whether it be with a kid that you fucking traded a pound cake for for a fucking soda and how fucking excited they're like, I got this fucking American food or shaking their hand or fucking playing a game of cards with them. Like, it's a big fucking deal. They're, they're going to be telling that story for, for good. So, um, yeah, yeah, man, I'm glad. I'm glad. That was a fucking great answer, uh, by the way. So, um, so let's dig into your second deployment, man. You said you were getting hit a little bit more heavy. Fucking IEDs came into the picture out there. Did that stuff start happening right away? First of all, did you go over to the ship or did you guys fly there? Uh, flew both both times. Yeah, okay. flew. And the um, second one was Iraq as well, right? Yep, in a place called Karma. Karma. Ironically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was that place like? Um, it was interesting. Uh, we had a, a larger AO at the time, and so we were more mechanized, which is something that none of us had, had been too much a part of. We, we were mainly on foot uh, for the previous three years, so uh, it was interesting covering more land, um, but with that came a lot of issues, and um, I think the any of the local um, groups that were there to, to try and keep us away, we all know who they are, um, were leveraging that to their benefit. Uh, so IEDs were a, a ginormous problem. Um, my my vehicle specifically um, was the first vehicle to ever get um, hit with a 57 millimeter Chinese rocket propelled IED, mm. uh, which launches from the ground up. Uh, a, a rocket propelled IED, you can imagine. Um, we got very very lucky uh, in that scenario, as I think we marked it. It actually hit about seven inches behind my gunner's head uh, on the top of an MRAP. And if it were seven inches further, the, the whole vehicle would have been completely uh, annihilated. And it ended up uh, having skipped off that and exploding in the berm and, and back blasting into us. Um, uh, but we got lucky. And these were the kind of things that we were, we were dealing with over there for seven months was, you know, pressure plate IEDs, you know, a lot of 155 shells wired under the ground. Um, and this was like a freaking constant threat, no matter how much, you know, um, complacency avoidance we were doing with taking different routes and changing this up and changing that up um, so that that was a big issue um, and even with the airdrops we started receiving uh, by the time the wind took it it could have been half a mile or a mile away sometimes it was already raided when we were trying to get resupplied so we, we had a lot of interesting um, scenarios on the second deployment uh, and the IEDs threw a wrench in um, to a lot of our guys that sucked because you can't see it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was definitely a different dynamic. That first IED, did it, did, uh, did everybody survive that? Uh, the, the mine, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, le honestly, it was, uh, one of the most luckiest and amazing days of my life, uh, as far as how lucky we got from that. Um, and I think they, they ended up marking it down as the first ever in history in that part of Iraq. Um, so that was, that was an interesting story. I'm glad we could tell. Um, and essentially what they, they had done, uh, we ended up raiding the, the uh, village beside us uh, almost immediately. It was a crazy operation. I think we brought over 150 Marines online and ran through over like 200 houses within hours. Mm. Um, but they were basically putting posts in the dirt. Um, for almost like half a mile leading from that dirt road all the way back to the village and they were there were posts that went out with a copper wire and they basically would they would judge mathematically and wait for for your vehicle to be within a certain range of those posts uh, before clicking the button to try and launch it so it was, it was almost an interestingly sophisticated um, move to make for limited technology in that area so was, I was surprised um, at seeing something like that were, was there anything that you guys would look out for um, while you're on a convoy, um, like any signs that you would look out for um, to try to help you, uh, you know, determine whether there's might be some IEDs up ahead or any of that? Uh, well, after that day, any posts uh, that you mm -hmm. saw anywhere was definitely something to think about. We'd keep an eye out for that. Um, any fast moving oncoming vehicle, which that's that's pretty standard um, to obviously keep an eye out for and not allow close to you. Um, we'd look if it was paths that we kind of had no choice but to travel more than not. I mean, we were obviously looking for any kind of dirt that seemed out of the normal, um, as far as like ruffled up and could have been dug out and then replaced there. Um, that was, that was really, really big for us. Um, other than that, I mean, there's, there's so many variants, like, you know, um, if you see an empty bag of Doritos on the side of the road, you know, stop and check it kind of stupidity that you're never going to have time to do. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, like looking for, looking for the dirt that seems out of the ordinary and you spend enough time uh, in that area that you very quickly kind of learn like what, what feels off, what seems off. Um, is nobody anywhere around this area we've been driving down for a mile? Is that weird? Uh, why isn't the same guy that usually walks down this road walking down this road? Like, is that weird? So um, you start kind of like playing the area and trying to think through things um, as you're going and obviously go through that uh, prior to rolling out. So, mm. um, is this, so the second deployment, man, is this where you've lost two guys on this one? Um, actually, no. Um, this deployment, we didn't. It was moving straight into this into Afghanistan is where, uh, where our, my two guys um, mm. passed away. Oh, okay. So, and that third deployment was one that I was um, set to go on and ended up getting pulled from due to uh, being injured. Yeah. Uh, that kind of, how did, how did that make you feel? Uh, um, you know, I've talked with uh, some of the guys a little bit. Um, you, it's a tough question. I, I think I run, you run through these things in your head a lot. I, uh, sometimes you think, you know, do people make the decisions to, to go on these uh, journeys with you because you made the decision to go? Um, and to give context to that, um, I think there was maybe 20 of us that had volunteered. Uh, so I was slated to go. And you kind of ask yourself, do other people that raise their hand, raise their hand because you raise your hand? Um, and then you start going down the road of, he didn't make it back, so would he have made it back? If I was there, did he make the decision to go because um, our group that he knew made the decision to go? And you start kind of going down rabbit holes. Um, so I had gotten injured a few weeks after that, so I needed a full reconstructive uh, surgery on my left shoulder. Um, so I got pulled from that deployment, um, and a lot of my guys went um, to initially go clear the Bujibas Pass, which was uh, in the Helmand province in Afghanistan. Uh, they attached a 3-4, and I think there were some other units at the time. Um, so, yeah, I think I could spend an hour talking about how I played with my head. Um, whether it be, do you think of things from a regretful position? You know, could you have changed anything anyways? You know, you, you tell yourself no. But I think you play with things probably forever in your head. Right, right. Um, were you close to those guys? Were you Somewhat. Um, I Luckily for me, um, I don't even know if luckily is a, a good word. Uh, the two men were not in my direct squad, but they, they were uh, within our companies. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, you, d you definitely uh, uh, feel the pain for sure and, and feel the pain of the guys that are around you. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> how long was your second deployment? How long did you stay out there? Seven months. Yeah, Another same thing. Months again. Yep. Mm. Um, what was your, I'm curious, I, I don't, I don't really ask people this. I haven't, but what was your favorite thing about being in the military? Um, or you know what, what did you, what would you say you got out of it the most? Um, I, I would say probably one of my favorite things is camaraderie. Uh, one of the largest things I took from it was perspective. Um, Camaraderie because I think when you put a bunch of people in situations, and there was a quote that went along with this that, that was so true, but you put a bunch of people in a situation, in an extraordinary situation, um, and you can create a bond that you can't in any other part of life. And I think maybe people in professional sports might feel it to a certain degree. Uh, I think you go a step deeper when people's lives are on the line every day. Uh, I think you go into even a darker place in the brain, but almost also a, a deeper, funnier place in the brain with them, a deeper emotional place in the brain. So you create um, friendships that truly become unbreakable. And to that, I think there's nothing like it on the planet. Um, and I am thankful for that. And a lot of these guys I talk to now that I can confide fully in and I'm the most comfortable with. I'm not trying to pretend or worry about who I am around them. And, and to me, that's very satisfying, and I appreciate that um, perspective because not a lot bothers me today. Um, and I've failed businesses. I've succeeded at things. Um, and I'm always thinking to myself, you know, it can be worse. And I've been in situations that I've fucking hated 
and I couldn't do anything about that were painful and I was crying um, and I don't really find in other aspects of my life going through that kind of pain so I've gained a lot of perspective on what the world could be like um, what it is like in a lot of third world countries what other people don't have the ability to change in their life um, and that's painted a lot of perspective for me mm. yeah that's deep man um, what about uh, what was your least favorite part about being uh, your experience in the military um, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I think that at times you can play a lot of stupid games that fall under the mass punishment category of you get forced to, to be on the repercussion side of something, even when it's not your fault. And I think to a degree that almost can not benefit you once you get to a certain point. Uh, where you're just playing stupid fuck fuck games. Um, so there were definitely times and we've all experienced those where you're being punished and it kind of gets to a point where, you know, you're going down a path that is not fucking helping anybody. And guess what? You're not going to be able to do anything about it. So uh, maybe some a little bit in that category. Um, there also is things from a political perspective that um, I disagreed with and that was some of the deciding factors for why I got out. Um, and to kind of culminate, well, I'm trying to think of if, if there's any way I get in trouble for these, this, um, mm -hmm. there, the administration that was in during those years, uh, wanted things to look like it was perfect in, in Iraq, uh, probably in Afghanistan as well at the time. Um, we had had a vehicle get hit with an IED super hard one day and devastate most of the people inside it, um, in our company. And um, I recall when it was going up the chain of command that that had happened, um, it came back down from the administration back um, at the Capitol in the U.S. that um, they were going to claim it was a remnant of a foreign war from the past and they were going to do that because then they could classify it as not a, a, a new issue and it would allow them to show face that we were doing good and there was no issues and that we could pull out of Iraq even faster. The problem is they completely disregarded what we were even doing. And it was, it was almost showing that those guys had gotten annihilated um, almost for nothing. Not for nothing, but not showing the reality of we still have a lot of fucking issues over here. And we're still getting hit with new shit every day. Um, I'll, I'll keep it very generalized like that to not get myself into any trouble. But it was something where uh, I looked at and I said... I, on the fucking news in the U.S. is probably one thing. Some of the shit really going down over here is another. Um, I, I don't agree with uh, how they're trying to portray this. We need help and we have issues. And, um, you know, this isn't from fucking 50 years ago. This is a brand new fucking, uh, you know, 155 show that came out of that ground. Um, so, you know, th that's kind of some of the, that's one factor. But there were other political factors where um, I felt almost like, the guys on the top should probably come down to the guys on the bottom and, and live there for a while to, uh, mm. to feel and see what was really going on. And that wasn't happening. That, that was tough for me. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the fucking story of government work right there. It almost seems like the people that, you know, once they move up, they forgot what it was fucking like, um, you know, on the ground. Um, so, yeah, I get it, man. Um, so you got out in uh, 2010, right? Yep. Um, what was it like transitioning out for you? And was there any significant um, reason you chose not to re-enlist? Uh, did you have any plans from getting out? Talk to me about that. Um, you know, I think uh, I am slightly entrepreneurial, and I think that that was a disadvantage in the Marine Corps because it's a well-oiled machine that operates on one track, uh, like most government entities and branches. Um, I always wanted to try things a different way, things that I thought could be more useful or effective and was always denied. That was definitely something that weighed on my brain for, um, like I could progress things and I will never have that opportunity to do it the way I want it. Um, I had also had a very huge surgery uh, from being injured in 2009. It took me a year of rehab to recover. Um, and so I knew physically I wasn't at like peak capability at the end of my four years. Um, and so that those two things, along with uh, some of those political issues that had happened, 
kind of gave me the pros and cons that leaned a slight bit more towards the cons. I definitely had pros, um, but it leaned me a little bit more toward cons. So I, I knew that I was going to uh, get out. Um, and I had talked a close buddy of mine into getting out uh, with me, which he probably should have stayed in because uh, that, that's, that's who he is. And I, and I kind of dragged him out. Um, that's an important piece because we leveraged each other um, coming out. Uh, because we knew each other really well and we were going to end up running into issues that we could lean on each other's shoulder for painfully when it came to trying to find a job or are we going to make it to the next month or this or that. Um, and a lot of guys don't have that. They, they don't have somebody else around them. Um, it could be just their wife or they're alone or you know all these different scenarios. One of the best things I think that I did was we, we, him and I came out here together. Um, and I fucking leaned on him when I was having really difficult times and vice versa. And that kind of helped push us through that first stage. Mm. Now, um, when you talk about having difficult times, did, um, any of your experience, you know, your two tours in Iraq, um, while you're in the Marines or any other experience while you're in the military affect you at all mentally, um, after getting out? Um, I think that I buried as much of my life as I could in a chest, um, but I was also drinking constantly I th during that time, so I almost don't even know if I recognized my own mentality, um, which is interesting when I reflect on it these days, um, because, you know, getting fucked up every day was not like an issue. That was like, oh, that's just a way of life. Mm -hmm. So I think I buried a lot of myself um, in a chest that I never... You know, I never wanted to talk about the military. I never wanted people to know I was in the military. I was looking for a job. I was drinking every night. Um, I was doing some other stupid shit uh, as well. And that was a normalcy to me. Um, what I did have was grit, discipline, um, work ethic. And those uh, helped me out because I didn't know how to write a resume. The stupid fucking steps and taps program don't do shit. Something I would love to change. Um, and so... When I went to first get a job, which was actually at LA Fitness, believe it or not, um, they wanted me to have a resume and I didn't have one. So my buddy, who will probably be on this in the future, Nick, recalls that I slept in my car for three days in the parking lot at LA Fitness off Michelle and Jamboree. Uh, I slept there for three days until the manager hired me because I didn't fucking know how to fill any of the stuff out that he wanted. Um, but I knew I wanted to be there and I wanted to show him. So like four o'clock every single morning, I fucking step out of my car uh, waiting for that guy to get there. And on, on the fourth day, I, he hired me, I believe it was. Mm, um, wow. So a unique situation. Um, but for me, uh, uh, one of the only ways I knew how to fucking get through to somebody. Yeah. Um, when you got out, did you keep in touch with uh, the people that you served with? Not as well as I should have. Um, I believe about five other guys moved to Orange County within a six month span are of our guys. So we had a small group of us, none of them from here really either. Some from San Francisco, Washington, blah, 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 all these different places. So we had this kind of small click for the first probably six months. And then they started kind of moving away. Uh, two of them went back to Washington state, um, in other areas, so on and so forth. So I did keep in contact with a very small group you know, my immediate guy, the guys in that, you know, the, the other 12 men in that squad, you know? So, I mean, th those were the guys that, um, I was the tightest with, you know, you're still talking to every day, bullshitting with calling. Um, and you not maybe you, but I've let that slide a lot. Um, I do have a couple that I still talk with every single day, a lot that I don't talk to as much as I should. And, you know, you, you think about it a lot, especially with multiple suicides over the years from some of these guys, um, so yeah. Yeah. I was just going to mention that because we were talking about the suicide stuff earlier. Um, how did you take that? Like, is it something like, so for me, you know, you get out, it seems like every year, every other year or so you get the phone call. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? He took his life and this is how he did it. Um, how did it work for you? Um, it's tough. Um, I've got three yeah, suicides, um, very close guys. Um, this kind of goes back to the, the regret, regret questions you find yourself asking. Um, why am I not like pinging them every single morning? 
um, what is what is going through their head in that moment, what's like unique to that situation. Um, fuck, it's crazy. It's like um, I feel like I'm doing good or I'm doing well, and um, you know, one of these motherfuckers is is goes through a breakup with um, you know a fiance, a wife, uh, a girlfriend, whatever, and that little tick is just what like accelerates the rest and then whatever sometimes starts coming out of their mind from the military side and it becomes a snowball and then everything starts kind of crashing around it. Um, it's tough. Each situation is, is unique and different. Um, I find myself sometimes saying it's fucking selfish, selfish motherfucker. Um, you know, you got three kids. Um, I find myself sometimes, well, I mean, like thinking why like why didn't I figure something out like would I have known if I fucking texted him um I have a very close buddy I I was telling you before this interview last week reached out to me I didn't fucking talk to him for like six months he just got out of the hospital he checked himself in to fucking suicide watch um over towards the east coast and yeah like I don't know I think there's triggers in life outside of the military that when those triggers happen causes other triggers to start snowballing Mm -hmm. and then everything kind of starts going down a hill and then it becomes too late and i'm not sure exactly what the solution is um i've used platforms even myself like veterati if you've heard of that and a bunch of other shit um ptsd courses this that and the other but it's i don't know um it's always like i never see it coming then when it comes i think to myself was there red flags that I fucked up and I missed? And why wasn't I the motherfucker reaching out, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think we all experience those thoughts after that. something like that happens. You kind of backtrack and you're like, fuck, like, I should have called him more. I should have done this. Uh, you know, is there something I fucking missed? You know, you go on their fucking social media accounts and look at their last posts. Like, how, how are they fucking feeling on this day? What'd they say, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's rough. Um did you ever find yourself having thoughts like that at all, ever? Um, I had some very interesting thoughts along those lines. Um, I think more so in the first years. Um, it's tough. Um, I get into, I go down different bouts, and like, I think what I, like, how I am is I fucking bury everything in my life. Uh, which isn't the right way to do it. So I try and completely ignore and forget kind of just like that part of my life. And I just keep myself busy. I'm working, I'm doing this, I'm trying to build this. Um, And it's not until either I start having a few drinks or I get together with a lot of those guys um, where I just kind of start just running running thoughts through my brain. The um, weird opposing side of it is for as much as I can start digging things out of my head again, um, I'm the most comfortable when I'm with those guys. And so um, I fight an interesting battle where um, there's a certain darkness that I can dig into with, with my guys. Um, but then it's the most peaceful feeling I can have in my life because I'm around the people that know the inside of me like I know the inside of them. And, and so it's kind of an interesting uh, give and take balance I find there. Mm. Is there anything that you do now to cope with that? Uh, to manage that? Um, I, uh, eight men total um, I've lost, whether it be uh, some KIA uh, suicide or like I was mentioning before, there was a couple like um, odd situations that, that happened where a couple guys passed away. Um, I say that because I told myself, uh, I distinctly remember around 19 on the first deployment that when you when I when you're losing people that are 19 20 years old um you th- I was thinking a lot of like what the fuck's going to happen tomorrow um and I say that because I live my life very much so in a cliche way of I really don't know what tomorrow's going to bring but because of these experiences and and things I've lost young um I'm going to take chances and I'm going to take risks and so it's definitely created that style, that mentality for me um, in my life. And uh, I think I've been able to leverage experiences in a little bit of a positive light and, and being able to do that and saying, you know, it's, it is one life and, and I, you truly don't know um, kind of what's, what's really going to happen. You don't have a lot of control 
Uh, so you might as well take the chances and uh, burn down things if you have to uh, on your way as, as long as you're trying to fail forward and, and um, do good with, with what's around you. So, mm. um, What are you doing uh, now? Are you doing anything uh, with veterans? I know you, you help out on this. Uh, uh, what's the company called? Uh, I help with the, I do help with the Marine Raider Foundation. That's right. Uh, with their charity. Uh, usually there's, there's one large event they do here in Orange County each year. Um, aside from that, I did help with, um, uh, working wardrobes. If you're familiar with that out here, they, they have a veteran side that I was helping with for a little bit. I haven't in a long time. Um, uh, one thing I would love to do, um, if I found some other resources to help is, um, like I was mentioning before, uh, as well as, as I have land in Northern Arizona, uh, by the Grand Canyon. And it'd be great to turn that into a veteran, uh, veteran retreat. I'm totally cool with donating uh, the land itself to the, to the cause. Um, so I've, I've been looking for other veterans that have expertise. I don't, whether it be construction, solar, you name it, when it comes to literally like building out a container house style, uh, retreat on the property off the grid. So, um, that's kind of something that, that sparked my interest is one of wanting to do. Um, I'm going to try and expand it to 10 acres here soon. So it's, it's open land. So, mm. yeah. Awesome, man. That's awesome. I think that would make a big impact, you know, all vets to get together, go to a retreat like that. That's dope. Um, well, we're winding down, man, I'm getting ready to cut the tape. Uh, but before we do, I always like to ask, you know, if there's anything, any last words you want to say, anything you wanted to get out there before we cut the tape? Um, I guess, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm as cool as a lot of the other guys that are, that have come on here, but, um, you, you are, know, man. from, uh, from the, from the experience I have and, and, what I've ran into um, even more recently with, with some of the guys that I served with is just fucking send a text out and um, fuck with some of the guys and girls that, uh, that, that you served with. If, if, if you were in um, different occupations or whatnot, um, just reach out to people. Um, it's really just a text. It doesn't take, take that much. So uh, maybe you spend one day a month where you, you know, have the 20 people that, that you ping and you set it on your calendar. Fucking first Monday every month, I'm going to shoot these texts out. And maybe they're boring, same texts every time. But um, I think it's good to good to check on on everybody and um, see how they're doing. Let them know you're there for them, and um, yeah, do what you can. So yeah, um, you're definitely as cool as everybody else that's taking the seat, man. Just so you know, um, you know we don't we don't just do this just to kind of get war stories. Um, you know, we we like every single person who served our country to feel comfortable telling their story in that seat and to know that they have a story to tell. So yeah, man, um, I, we're, we're here to fucking uplift and celebrate anybody that's chosen to sacrifice any portion of their lives to our fucking country. So um, with that said, thank you for being here, John. Appreciate it, man. It's a big deal for us. Yeah, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no 